Good afternoon. Probably everybody knows I'm Ross Wilson. I'm the director of the Dina Patricia Eurasia Center uh, at the Atlantic Council and pleased to welcome all of you to this session entitled Realizing Shock Denise in the Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, a number of us in this room uh, have worked on issues of Caspian oil and gas development over many, many years. Uh, I see Dick Morningstar uh, down the way. I think Matt Bryce is here somewhere. I see many colleagues from SOCAR, uh, from the Turkish government, uh, from elsewhere. And looking back on this, I think for many years it seemed like gas was going to be the next thing. It was going to be the next thing after Azeri Shirak Ganeshli uh, got sort of done. It was going to be the next thing after the sanctioning of BTC. It was going to be the next thing after, the, the, uh, after BTC was opened. Uh, in, uh, in 2006, and it's continued to be the next thing for really, I think, quite a while. Over the course of the last six, nine, maybe 12 months, it's stopped being the next thing, and it started being the thing, the thing that is happening. It is, the issue has transformed itself after a lot of back and forth among the parties, a lot of back and forth among the companies, uh, extraordinarily complicated conversations uh, between a number of countries, including in particular uh, uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey. Finally, it looks now in November 2012 like this extraordinarily complicated project that involves massive, uh, that involves, uh, massive financial requirements to develop large, very large scale gas resources, new onshore facilities, thousands of miles of pipeline, uh, to connect markets in many, many different countries, that this is finally uh, nearing liftoff. And as I look back over the events that we, the Atlantic Council, have hosted here, clearly a very important milestone was the, were the remarks that uh, SOCAR President Rovnag Abdullayev made at this event last year here in Istanbul, where he announced uh, the uh, Trans-Anatolian Pipeline, which I think has been one of the keys, if not the key, to open up uh, real progress toward the realization of the Southern Ga Gas Corridor and therefore of Shak Denise. Say one other piece of context. It, I have long thought that the development of Shak Denise and the development of this new gas pipeline infrastructure would be important not just for Azerbaijan and for Turkey and for European customer, other European customers further downstream, but would also be exceptionally important for galvanizing the development and the transit of other gas, other Azerbaijani gas, potentially gas that lies further to the east in Turkmenistan, to some extent possibly other Central Asian countries, gas that might come from, uh, from Iraq or certainly from the northern part of Iraq, the Kurdistan region, maybe in a different political environment from Iran. So this can be a pol an important political and practical catalyst that has immense ramifications uh, economically for this region of the world, obviously for the countries around the Caspian, certainly for Turkey, and I think also for Europe as it looks further to, dev to diversify its uh, sources of, uh, of, um, uh, of energy. To discuss this today, uh, we have uh, a number of uh, distinguished uh, participants uh, who each have been involved uh, in, uh, in the Southern Gas Corridor for, uh, for many different years. Uh, we do not, I should say, have with us Rovnak Abdullayev, who spoke at the, at the first session this morning in place of uh, Azeri Energy Minister Natik Aliyev, who at the last minute could not be with us. Uh, but I think this will make for a somewhat more efficient conversation with, uh, with one fewer person. Uh, and I guess to start from, uh, from uh, my extreme left, uh, we're pleased to have Reinhard Mitschek, uh, longtime managing director of the Nabucco Gas uh, Pipeline International uh, Consortium or group. Uh, very pleased to welcome you here. Uh, Al Cook is the vice president uh, for Shock Denise Development at BP. Uh, the guy for BP, I think, who's charged with pulling together uh, this massive and extremely complicated uh, project. Richard Morningstar, now America's ambassador to the European Union. Uh, but for, for a number of years, uh, the, uh, the U.S. government's uh, point person on Caspian energy development and Eurasian energy development, both in the first Obama administration and going back uh, in the Clinton administration uh, as well, and in the interim, 
uh, served as America's ambassador to the European Union. Uh, we're pleased to welcome the acting uh, chairman and general manager of Botash, Mehmet uh, Konuk, uh, here to talk a little bit about the Turkish peace. And finally, Ketel Tungland, uh, managing director of the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, uh, uh, originally from, Sokar, from uh, Statoil, uh, but very much involved in one of the two projects uh, that, that, that are proposed to move beyond Turkey uh, further into European markets, Trans-Adriatic Pipeline uh, and, the, uh, and the Nabucco project. What I thought we would do is start in the east, work our way to the west, uh, and then go back to Ambassador Morningstar to fill out the picture uh, I I based on his experiences both in general on Caspian Energy and also his experience now uh, in Azerbaijan. And so with that, I think I'll turn the floor to, to Al Cook to describe for us the current state of play on Shaktanese, if you would please, Shaktanese and the Southern Gas Corridor. What are the next key couple of milestones and, and I hope, if not in your conclusion now, perhaps a little bit later, get to, the con get to the point, where will we be when we gather here in 12 months at the next Atlantic Council uh, Energy and Economic Summit? Where will this project be and, and what then will be the next milestones? Al, please. Thank you very much. And as you say, it's, um, it's a terrific panel to be part of in terms of the whole scope of the Southern Corridor. And uh, between Reinhard, Kettle, Mehmet Bey. We've all been part of the journey over the last 12 months that you've talked about, and Ambassador Morningstar, if you like, has been the guardian angel of the Southern Corridor for longer than most of us can remember and continues to be. So what I'll do is I'll just, um, over the next five, 10 minutes, is just give you a sense from our perspective of what's happened over the last 12 months, touch briefly on what we've learned and the philosophy of the Southern Corridor going forward, and then perhaps pick up finally on your question uh, around where we need to be over the next 12 months. So what has happened since we sat in the Atlantic Council this time last year? I think the progress actually has been quite good, as good as, us, as, good as any of us dared hope for. And you began by talking about um, the project of the future, and I think we can genuinely say that over the last 12 months, we've begun to move from sheets of paper to sheets of steel as we take on what is a $40 billion project stretching 4,000 kilometers from Azerbaijan to Europe. And if you want evidence of that, perhaps you need look no further than the Caspian Sea, where for the first time we now have two mobile drilling rigs on the Chardonnay's field the uh, Istigal rig and the Maersk Hadar Aliyev rig, um, which are now going to be drilling in parallel on the Chardonnay's field alongside the existing rig we have on the first phase development. That in itself is evidence of the seriousness and the intent of the participants in Chardonnay's. Those rigs alone cost around about $1 million a day in terms of expenditure, and we wouldn't be putting that amount of capital into Chardonnay's if we weren't immensely serious about doing the project and confident that we can take it from being the project of the future to the project of the present. If you start with the Caspian, you'll see the drilling rigs. If you then move to Sangashal, you'll see the work we're doing there on the expansion of the Sangashal terminal. Sangashal terminal is already the biggest oil and gas terminal outside the Middle East, and we're undertaking a substantial expansion of that. On the South Caucasus pipeline, uh, we've now agreed with SOCAR and the Azerbaijan government the exact scope for that pipeline expansion. And that'll be done with 56-inch diameter pipeline. And the reason for that is because we want to put in place not just the right facilities for Chardonnay Stage 2, but also an investment in the future, demonstrating our confidence that Chardonnay 2 will be followed by further sources of Azerbaijani gas. And then further into Turkey where, as you mentioned, this time last year, uh, there was the announcement by SOCAR on the creation of the Trans-Anatolia pipeline. And the Turkish government and the Azerbaijan government have worked immensely constructively together to put in place the intergovernmental agreements, the host government agreements for the Trans-Anatolia pipeline. And in parallel with that, companies like BP have 
uh, stated their intention to join TANAP. And in BP, we will be taking a 12% stake in the Trans-Anatolia pipeline and seeking to bring the experience we have from BTC, the resources we have, and the project coordination abilities we have to support, to support SOCAR and to support the Turkish government in making TANAP a success. And then we come on to the European pipelines where we've cooperated immensely closely with both the Trans-Adriatic pipeline and the Nabucco pipelines. And of course, we're here today with just two options, whereas a year ago we had four options for the pipelines. And that demonstrates our, our increasing confidence in what will make up the pieces of the jigsaw of the Southern Corridor. And even this week, we are working very closely with both the pipelines to understand how we can best ensure we meet the needs of the pipelines, the gas consumers in Europe, but also the needs of the Chardonnay's participants in the upstream. So that's where we are today. And I think it's been a, a very successful year. But as we'll come on to, there are still, as always, plenty of challenges ahead. I secondly wanted to talk a little bit about the philosophy and what we've learned over the last year. And I think it's worth pausing for a moment to reflect on the fact that we are embarking upon a $40 billion project at a time when most companies around the world are cutting back on their capital expenditure. And at a time when, in Europe, what we're actually seeing is reduced gas demand in the short term and reducing potential gas prices in the longer term. So it's worth pausing for reflection to think about what that means for the Southern Corridor. Above all, I think it means two things. Firstly, we have to deliver a Southern Corridor project which is both cost efficient and scalable for the future. And that's a fine balance. If we put too much cost into the project, if we to put too much capacity in the pipelines, uh, if we're too ambitious, we won't get the project off the ground. We won't be able to make Chardonnay's too economic. However, if we're not ambitious enough, we won't be able to scale up the infrastructure so that when future gas comes, whether it's from Azerbaijan or from other countries, uh, we need to be able to bring that into the infrastructure and develop that through the same southern corridor. So it's that balance of cost and efficiency. Uh, cost efficiency on the one hand and scalability on the other hand that we really need to seek to get right. And that's particularly important at a time when we have a massively expensive set of capital undertakings um, at the same time as a European gas market which is deeply competitive. And I think the second point is we recognize we need to be competitive. We recognize we need to come into Europe with a source of gas that addresses European needs. Uh, and the announcements recently on South Stream simply underline the fact that it's deeply important that as Chardonnay's gas, as Azerbaijan gas comes into Europe, it meets the needs of the consumers. They have a choice, and we intend their choice to be that Azerbaijani gas fulfills their needs best of all. So then, if you look forward to, your third, to the third point, to your question on what needs to happen over the next 12 months, well, I think 2013 is a huge year for us. It's the year in which we'll take a final investment decision on Chardonnay's stage two. In the short term, what we need to do is we need to put in place the commercial decisions which build upon the political um, infrastructure, the political framework that's been put in place by the intergovernmental agreements, the host government agreements in Turkey and in Europe. We need to put in place the agreements for TANAP uh, and we need to put in place the agreements for the other pipelines. Secondly, um, we need to move forward with European pipeline selection. And it's become clear that uh, in the first phase of the Southern Corridor, certainly for the purposes of Chardonnay's too, we can only support a single pipeline into Europe. And we need to work very closely with uh, Reinhard's Nabucco project and Kietel's TAP project to make sure that by June next year, we have the two best pipeline projects possible and we can work with them to decide what the right combination is going forward. And we understand that that decision needs to be a balance of commercial uh, imperatives, the decision needs to be an economic decision, but we also need to make sure that we have the strong support of all the countries involved for the long term because we will certainly need over a period of 30 years of project development 
to make sure we're addressing the concerns not just of the commercial participants involved, but also the governments, the companies, the European Commission, the United States governments that are key stakeholders in the Southern Corridor project. And all of that will come into place at a time when we need to bring really four different projects now. Chardonnay's two in the upstream, the expansion of the South Caucasus pipeline, TANAP and the European pipeline. We need to bring all those four pipelines into a synchronized move forward so that we can be confident not only can we make a final investment decision together, but on a day in 2018 when we bring gas from the first Chardonnay's two well under the water in the Caspian Sea, we have the Sankashal terminal ready, we have the South Caucasus pipeline ready, we have TANAP ready, we have the European pipeline ready, and we have gas consumers in Europe who want to buy, who want to burn gas from Azerbaijan and start the Southern Corridor really flowing. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's an excellent way to start us. Thank you very much, Al. We move uh, a couple of countries over to the west. Uh, Turkey obviously plays an extremely important role as a transit country for this gas. It is also an important consumer country. That's not necessarily uh, the work of Botas. Uh, but I'd like to turn the floor over to, uh, to Mehmet Konuk. Please give us uh, uh, where these projects stand in your calculations, where you see significant uh, issues that, are, that arise out of the presentation that, uh, that Al Cook gave, and where, from your point of view, uh, this, should, this project should be in November 2013. Please. Teşekkür ederim. Sayın Başkan, kıymetli konuklar, değerli katılımcılar, Atlantik Konseyi'nin düzenlemiş olduğu bu toplantı vesilesiyle öncelikle şahsım ve BOTAŞ adına hepinize hoş geldin diyorum. Sevgi ve saygılarımı sunuyorum. Sabahki oturumda Sayın Bakanlar ve diğer e, değerli katılımcılar, konuşmacılar, transit projelerin stratejik, ekonomik ve arz güvenliği noktasında genel perspektifte değerlendirmeler sundular, rakamlar verdiler ve bu projelerin öneminin altını çizdiler. Türkiye bu projenin ve bu transit projelerin neresinde neden bu projelere önem veriyor? Öncelikle Türkiye'nin bulunduğu coğrafyaya baktığımızda dünya petrol ve doğalgaz rezervinin önemli bir kısmının sahip olduğu bir coğrafyada. Orta Doğu, Doğu ve Kafkasya coğrafyasında. Aynı zamanda Türkiye liberal ekonomide gelişmekte olan serbest pazarda üretimini yapan ve rekabetçi bir özel sektör yatırım ve üretiminin önümüzdeki yıllarda daha da artarak gelişeceği sadece kendi ülkesinde değil dünyada da çeşitli alanlarda rekabet için vizyon geliştiren bir ülke. Bu ne anlama geliyor? Gelişmekte olan olan bir ülkede en önemli husus enerji tüketimindeki de artış. Gerek elektrik sektöründe, gerekse diğer fosil yakıtlar itibariyle baktığımızda her geçen yıl geçtiğimiz 2001 yıldan itibaren dönem dönem Türkiye'yi de etkileyen ekonomik krizlere rağmen gelişme hızı en yüksek olan ülkelerin başında gelmektedir. Tabi bu çerçevede Türkiye olarak bir taraftan kendi artan ihtiyacını karşılamak değişik kaynaklardan kaynak çeşitlendirmesiyle enerjisini temin etmek ve aynı zamanda batının artan ihtiyacını karşılamak için güvenilir, istikrarlı bir güzergah 
konumunu ortaya koymak için çalışmaktadır. Doğal gaz tüketimine baktığımızda son iki yıllık dönemde doğal gaz tüketimi aşağı yukarı yüzde yirmi, yüzde yirmi beşlik bir artış gösterdi. Geçen yıl doğal gaz tüketimi 43 milyar metreküp seviyesindeyken bu yıl 48 milyar metreküpü aştı. Peki bu ihtiyacı nereden sağlıyoruz? Beş ayrı ülkeden İran, Azerbaycan, Rusya Federasyonu boru hattıyla sağladığımız doğalgaz arz kaynakları Cezayir ve Nijerya ile uzun dönemli anlaşmalarla aldığımız sıvılaştırmış doğalgaz. Peki bunların toplam hacmi ne kadar? Yaklaşık 51 milyar metreküp. Bu yıl 48 milyar metreküpü aşıyoruz. Önümüzdeki yıl 50 milyar metreküp seviyesinde olacak. Ve daha sonraki dönemlerde bu tüketim artacak. Ve yapılan tahminlere göre 2020 yılında Türkiye'nin doğalgaz ihtiyacının 70 milyar metreküp seviyesine ulaşacağı tahmin edilmektedir. Bu şu anlama geliyor. Ilave kaynaklara ihtiyaç var. Aynı zamanda kaynak aynı kaynaklardan değil farklı güzergah ve ka farklı kaynaklardan doğalgaz temini. Bunlardan en önemlisi de şu anda ilave bir kaynak olarak Azerbaycan faz 2 projesinden üretilecek doğalgaz. Bu konuyla alakalı başta hükümetimiz olmak üzere BOTAŞ olarak muhatabımız Sokar firması ve konsorsiyumla yaptığımız görüşmeler neticesinde Türkiye'nin artan doğalgaz ihtiyacını bir kısmını ilave bir doğalgaz alım satım anlaşmasıyla Azerbaycan'dan temin etmek üzere bir anlaşma yapmak. Diğer taraftan toplamda ilk aşamada 16 milyar metreküplük bir üretim öngörülen faz 2 projesi kapsamında kalan 10 milyar metreküpü de Avrupa'nın ihtiyacı için Türkiye üzerinden bir transit taşımacılığı yapmak. Bu konuda gerçekleştirilen çalışmalar sonucunda 2011 25 Ekim'de ev sahibi ülke anlaşması ve hükümetler arası anlaşma imzalandı. Bu anlaşma kapsamında BOTAŞ ile SOKAR arasında 6 milyar metreküp ilave bir doğalgaz alım satım anlaşması imzalandı. Aynı zamanda 25 Ekim'de 10 milyar metreküp Şahdeniz faz 2 gazının Türkiye üzerinden Avrupa'ya taşınmasıyla alakalı transit anlaşmalar imzalandı. Tabii bu anlaşmada BOTAŞ sistemi ve BOTAŞ sisteminde yapılacak ilave yatırımlarla gazın taşınması öngörüyordu, görülüyordu. Fakat daha sonraki çalışmalar şunu gösterdi ki farklı bir boru hattıyla bir transit rejimine göre çalışacak bir boru hattı sistemini yaparak hem bu boru hattından Türkiye'nin ilave ihtiyacını temin etmek diğer taraftan da e, Avrupa'ya 10 milyar metreküpü taşımak. Bu konuda 24 Aralık 2011'de hükümetler arası bakanlar düzeyinde bir mutabakat zaptı imzalandı. Bunun akabinde sürdürülen çalışmalar sonucunda müstakil bir boru hattı inşasıyla yapımıyla alakalı olarak da 26 Haziran 2012 tarihinde ev sahibi ülke anlaşması ve hükümetler arası anlaşma imzalandı. Dolayısıyla dolayısıyla bu projenin Türkiye ayağıyla alakalı yapılması gereken anlaşmalar imzalanmış oldu. Tabi boru hattı inşaatında da aynı zamanda Türkiye'nin yüzde yirmilik bir ortaklık payı anlaşmada yer aldı. Bir kamu şirketi olarak BOTAŞ ve TEFA'nın da yer alacağı. Projenin lideri SOKAR olacak ve Sayın Alkuk'un da ifade ettiği gibi kalan 
yüzde seksenin yüzde yirmi dokuzluk kısmında konsorsiyum şirketleri öncelikli olmak üzere onlar arasında bir ortaklık dağılımı yapılması. Bu konuda da e, önemli bir aşama kaydedildiğini memnuniyetle öğrenmiş oluyoruz. Bundan sonraki bundan sonraki dönem ne olacak? Tabi e, işin finansman boyutu termini itibariyle 2017-2018 yılı öngörülüyor ve Türkiye kısmının devamı olarak da aynı şekilde alternatif daha önce dört alternatif vardı ikiye düştü bir tanesi Nabucco West diğeri de TAP projesi şu anda onunla alakalı da çalışmaları sürdürüyor Şahdeniz Konsorsiyumu muhatap olan Nabucco ve TAP şirketleriyle e, umuyoruz ki önümüzdeki yılın yani 2013'ün 13 yılının ortalarında e, hangi güzergahın seçimine karar verilecek ve ondan sonraki süreçte de inşaat dönemi başlayacak. Tabi burada Türkiye'nin bu projede yer almasının sebebi Biraz evvel ifade ettiğim gibi hem kendi ilave arz ihtiyacını karşılamak, kaynak çeşitlendirmesi ve transit güvenilir ve istikrarlı bir ülke olarak da bu tür projelerin artık merkezi bir havı olma noktasında projelere destek vermek. Bu destek bundan sonraki dönemlerde de devam edecektir. Biraz geriye gidecek olursak, o Türkiye sadece bir TANAP projesiyle başlamadı uluslararası alanda transit projelere. Geçmişe baktığımızda Baki, Tiflis, Ceyhan, Ham Petrol boru hattı bunun önemli bir başlangıcıydı. Bu tür projeler stratejik ve ekonomik açıdan değerlendirilmesi ve katkı sağlanması gereken projeler. Petrol boru hattı malumlarınız olduğu üzere 2006 yılında devreye alındı ve şu anda sorunsuz ve verimli şekilde devam ediyor. Aynı şekilde Türkiye'nin Avrupa'ya açılımının ilk adımı olan bir anlaşma daha yapmıştık. 2001 yılında Azerbaycan'la imzaladığımız 6.6'lık anlaşma daha sonra Türkiye ile Yunanistan arasında bir enterkoneksiyon anlaşması yaptık. Küçük bir miktar olsa bile orada bir bağlantıyı gerçekleştirdik. Buna paralel olarak Nabucco projesini başlattık. Şu anda TANAP Nabucco'nun Türkiye kısmındaki önceliği almış olmakla birlikte bu tür projeler Nabuk olsun, TAP olsun, IGTI olsun bu tür projeler transit boru hatları için kaynak satıcıyla üreticiyle alıcı arasında uygun koşullar olduğunda faaliyete her yönüyle geçebilecek projeler olarak değerlendiriyoruz. Bu nedenle, bu nedenle bu projelerin zaman olarak, ölçek olarak tabii ki bir önceliği var. Ama yapılan çalışmalar hiçbir zaman unutulacak, rafa kaldırılacak projeler değil. Mutlaka sadece Türkiye değil, Avrupa'ya da baktığımızda Sayın Bakanımızın sabahki konuşmalarında ifade ettiler. 2035 yılında, 30-35 yılında Avrupa'nın doğal gaz tüketiminin 700 milyar metreküp aşacağı. Bu ilave yaklaşık 200 milyarın üzerinde bir doğal gaz ihtiyacı demektir. Dolayısıyla üretim noktasında ve tüketici arasında e, varılacak mutabakat ve aynı zamanda istikrarlı ve ekonomik olarak da uygun bir güzergah bulunduğunda bu projeler realize 
olacaktır. Ben e, kısaca e, ilk aşamada bu bilgileri sizinle paylaşmak istedim. E, daha sonra e, soru cevap kısmında tekrar e, söz almak dileğiyle hepinize saygılar sunuyorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Konok. Um, so we've had laid out uh, very ambitious plans that BP has, $40 billion project uh, to ship, uh, to begin with 10 BCM of gas uh, all the way across Turkey and into European markets. Uh, discussion about a project that is both cost efficient but also scalable uh, that presumably allows some opportunity, provides for some opportunities for growth. Two competitive projects at this point, as Al indicated, uh, Nabucco and TAP. Um, I hope I'd, I'd ask you not so much to give us your sales pitch as, uh, as talk through with us the comparative, um, uh, the comparative advantages or the comparative differences, uh, what, what distinguishes your project, and also a little bit about what you see as kind of the, the steps forward for you, how you look back at the kind of timeline uh, that Al Cook has laid out. Um, to be somewhat arbitrary in the, in the order, why don't I start uh, with, uh, with TAP, with uh, Ketel Tunglin, and then we'll turn to, uh, turn to Nabucco. Ketel, please. Okay, thank you very much, Ross. I think I will try and do this uh, short and sweet, since I represent such a short and sweet pipeline project. Uh, <clears throat> TAP is a project supported by the German company E.ON, the Norwegian company Statoil, who is also a member of the Chinese consortium, and the Swiss energy giant Axpo. What the project is essentially about is um, <clears throat> an 800, around about 800 kilometer long pipeline from the western border of Turkey, uh, between Turkey and Greece, crossing Greece, crossing Albania, crossing the Adriatic Sea and ending up in Italy. The main design is to uh, transport the 10 billion cubic meters annually that Jacques Tanis is offering. But <clears throat> we're designing the pipeline such that the capacity can be doubled up to 20 by simply adding compression. So that's essentially what we are offering. The shortest way to this, a sizable, well-paying market in Italy for people who have gas that they have been able to transport to the western borders of Turkey. Supported by technically competent and financially strong owners. But as Al was illustrating, this is just one piece of a really big puzzle. Uh, all in all, the value chain from Baku to the market consists of six or seven projects. Uh, investment in the order of 40 to 45 billion US dollars. There are more than 10 companies, 10 at least companies, and six nation states. So this is really an international an intercompany project that needs to be coordinated very, very well. And so then, looking back at this session last year, what has happened? Um, I congratulate Al and BP and the Chinese Consortium for the progress that they have made, but I'm afraid I have to say that not enough has happened. By November not last year, <clears throat> there were four projects who had made their proposal to the Chinese Consortium. Of those proposals made 1st of October last year, TAP is the only project still standing. And the promise was that they would make a final selection before Christmas that year. Now it looks as if that selection will not happen until maybe mid next year. That means that this coordination of this giant project along the entire value chain is being delayed and postponed. All the better then that um, TAP was chosen in February for the southern leg. Uh, 
in the event that Sartanese wants to go to Italy with its gas. Following from that decision, uh, we have made agreements uh, with Sartanese to closer coordinate our cooperation. We signed a cooperation agreement between TAP and Sartanese in June, following from which uh, more members of the Sartanese consortium, uh, BP, SUCA, and Total, uh, made an arrangement with the existing owners of TAP to fund the costs of TAP. And this was then also uh, coupled with an option on their part to join the shareholding of TAP. Which means that um, TAP now has three more funding partners and three more companies to report to. So for all practical purposes, I have three more shareholders. Uh, and that sort of ties this uh, value chain tighter together. And that is a, a good thing in itself. I would also like to underline that with the three existing shareholders and the three new ones coming in, they have all six of them agreed that they are open and welcoming new partners to the project, whether they be from Italy, Greece, or, or Turkey. Even. And discussions to this effect are, are ongoing and I look forward to having more partners in the project. So what is going to happen uh, until next Atlantic Council meeting in, in November. <clears throat> well, first thing is that is going to happen is that TAP will complete all its technical studies and coordination with Shanghainese. Um, we will complete um, the intergovernmental agreement between Italy, Albania, and Greece. You will have noted that these three countries signed a memorandum in New York on 26th of September which kick-started the negotiations over this intergovernmental agreement. Next thing that happens is that TAP will be chosen as the final leg of Chartanese's value chain. <laughs> um, following from that, we will then make um, what we call a resolution to construct, which means uh, that the shareholders of TAP will commit themselves to start construction. And then, um, Chartanese will make its uh, parallel final investment decision. And that will then conclude um, the, the uh, value chain, I think. The, the, uh, the, the TAP consortium will consist of a new shareholder group uh, with the three existing ones and three new ones from Chartanese, but maybe also more companies from the countries that we're passing through. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's hear from the competition, Reinhard. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. I would like to thank the Atlantic Council for the invitation to give a report on the Nabucco project as it stands today. Uh, and I'm hap very happy to do that. Uh, well, Nabucco saw two, two important decisions this year, influencing the scope and uh, the overall framework of the project. One was that uh, Turkey and, and Azerbaijan uh, decided to develop the Trans-Anatolia pipeline across Turkey. And uh, the second was in, in June 2012, uh, Shaktinis decided in favor of Nabucco West versus uh, SIP. Uh, and from that time on, we started to have uh, very concrete, deep, and fruitful negotiations between the Shaktinis group, uh, Shelder group, and, uh, and the Nabucco West group. Um, we've heard today that uh, there is a tendency that upstream cost could increase and market prices go down. And that's a challenging situation for midstreamers. Uh, the midstreamer has to, to meet the requirements from both sides and has to optimize uh, the services and the cost. Optimization means uh, that uh, we have to attract a maximum of business opportunities. Uh, that creates a maximum of gas flow and the result of that 
is a minimum in cost per unit for the transport. Nabucco is not a, simply a pipeline bringing gas from A to B. Uh, Nabucco West is a 1,300 kilometers marketplace. We will construct this pipeline in a 48 inch diameter, starting to offer 10 BCM and stepwise increase the capacity up to 23 BCM. There are several intake and offtake points along the route. Nabucco will combine the national grids in Bulgaria, in Romania, in Hungary, in Austria, will interconnect to TANAP and to the downstream system in Baumgarten. Uh, Nabucco also offers gas not only to the Nabucco countries itself, but to all the countries in the Western Balkan. We have to consider that uh, there is an interconnection from Bulgaria to Macedonia. There are interconnections from Hungary to Croatia to Serbia, from Croatia to Slovenia. There is a planned interconnector from Hungary to Slovakia, from Austria, uh, downstream capacity increases. So that means that Nabucco as a marketplace offers gas for 500 million European customers. 140 market participants are registered client at the Central European Gas Hub in Baumgarten. Billions of cubic meters of gas storage capacity is available in Bulgaria, in Romania, in Hungary, in Austria to create flexibility for the gas transports. It's not simply a flat uh, gas stream coming from, from Turkey uh, across the countries of taking some gas and then ending up in, in Baumgarten. We will combine physical transports in Abuco and hub transactions from the Central European Gas Hub to uh, other hubs in Europe, uh, in the northwest of Europe, uh, in the south of Europe, etc. And this combination creates attractive business opportunities. In addition to that, I expect uh, that Nabucco will work in a bi-directional way. That means that also uh, capacity bookings in a reverse flow may be uh, expected. Uh, due to um, different scenarios uh, of uh, uh, storage flexibility in the various countries, the storage cover ratio in Austria, that is a ratio of uh, uh, gas storage volume to yearly consumption in a country is uh, about 50% in Austria. It's approximately 30% of the yearly consumption is in gas storage is in Southeast Europe, and it's 3% in Turkey. That means that there could be a need for uh, flexibility to be delivered and offered to Turkey, to Bulgaria, and to other countries. We have a perfect legal framework in place an intergovernmental agreement which is ratified by all involved governments and parliaments, project support agreements between Nabucco International and the host countries, exemptions from national regulatory authorities and the Commission. This legal framework reduces the risk of the project and that means again uh, cost minimization because the price for money for the financing of the project is lower. So all that are benefits Nabucco West can deliver. When we had the positive decision pro Nabucco West in June, as I said, we started negotiations with Shach Deniz. Um, in the meantime, we are far advanced in these uh, negotiations. In September, Nabucco offered the data room and Shach Deniz experts started their due diligence process. Um, in, also in September, we entered uh, a deep exchange and uh, interaction with TANAP. Also there we offered a data room uh, and we offer the, the engineering results we have uh, met in Turkey to TANAP. 
because it is very important to synchronize the timelines. Shach Denis, South Caucasus pipeline expansion, Tanab, and Nabucco West. That is a very important step, and that increases the credibility and, uh, and, uh, and, and the, the importance uh, of uh, that project. Uh, so all in all, Nabucco is on schedule. I expect that Shach Denis uh, will successfully negotiate with gas buyers uh, in the first half of next year. Uh, we will further develop our project, project management, the technical solutions, environmental impact assessments, and all the other elements which are needed to take off. And Nabucco will be ready to take off whenever the gas sales and purchase agreements are in place. Uh, we will start an open season. We will conclude transportation agreements and uh, then we, we are ready for a final investment decision. And uh, um, Nabucco West was a winner of the semi-final in June 2012 between Nabucco West and SEEP, and I'm very confident that Nabucco will be the winner of the final in June 2013. Thank you. I didn't know it was an elimination contest quite in that way, uh, but thank you very much, uh, Reinhardt. Uh, Ambassador Morningstar, you were one of the people in this room who I think goes uh, really all the way back to the beginning of America's work on, uh, on Caspian energy development and starting in 1998, I think. You have bring extraordinary ex perspective. I wonder if you could sort of fill in some of the pieces. Uh, how this relates to some of the work that you've been involved in. And of course, there's an uh, Azerbaijan specific piece you may wish to add to as well, please. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Ross. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you uh, for referring, me, referring to me as the guardian angel of the uh, Southern Corridor. Uh, my wife, Faith, is in the audience. I don't think she ever thought she would hear me described as an angel of, as an angel of any kind. Uh, so I want to I wanna thank you. Uh, for that. And I have to say also with respect to the Southern Corridor, I uh, never expected uh, to be even closer to it than I have been, uh, but now I feel like I'm in its womb in Baku. Uh, having, uh, having said that, uh, I'll start off just by making two very boring statements. One, uh, I feel as strongly as ever that there will be a Southern Corridor. Uh, I have <clears throat> no doubt in my mind anyway of that. Uh, the second, uh, after listening to the uh, descriptions, the very good uh, uh, cases being made both by uh, Kettel and uh, Reinhard Michik, uh, I'll say what I've said and others in our government have said many times, we're neutral uh, as between TAP uh, and Nabucco West. Uh, there are only two things we're concerned about. One, that if TAP is chosen, that there be a connection into Southeast Europe, and there appear to be commitments as to that. I see Al shaking, uh, nodding his head. So, uh, And also uh, that, uh, that any pipeline uh, be expandable, as Al described and some of the others have described earlier. Let me just briefly talk about a couple of macro issues which may add a little more context. This relates a little bit to what Al was saying at the beginning. I think by the very nature of <coughs> the issue, uh, there is a difference in approach between countries like Azerbaijan and Turkey uh, and companies, for example, the Shak Denise partners. Countries are going to, uh, particularly Azerbaijan, but also Turkey, are going to emphasize the strategic aspect of things, uh, as they should. Uh, Azerbaijan, uh, for example, is uh, concerned what's going to happen with respect to future gas. Uh, there's the Shak Deniz project, but there are also other projects that will hopefully be up and going by the uh, um, early to mid-2020s. And how is that gas going to be taken care of, which is the reason why expandability uh, <clears throat> is absolutely critical. The companies are obviously, and ought to be, uh, emphasizing, uh, emphasizing the commercial aspects. And I think this has, has created uh, some issues, 
But I'm heartened by the fact that I think that both the countries, SOCAR and the Shaktanese partners, are understanding where they're coming from maybe more than they have before. And I think that uh, the companies understand the absolute need for expandability. In fact, many of the Shaktanese partners are involved in other projects uh, in, in Azerbaijan. And I think Azerbaijan and Turkey certainly understand that there needs to be, that the projects uh, need to be commercially viable. I think where that issue uh, that I've just raised has surfaced that appears to have been resolved is, without getting into the weeds, the recent dispute as to what the engineering design ought to be on the South, uh, on the South Caucasus pipeline. But after some pretty testy going back and forth, uh, the parties sat down and, and, and resolved, resolved that issue. Uh, and uh, I think to the satisfaction of both and have, <clears throat> have come to a very rational solution. But this issue can, will continue uh, under the surface or at the surface uh, because of questions of market uh, demand, uh, pricing, uh, that will be, I think, an issue uh, over the coming years. Uh, we'll see. Uh, that for the project, which whether it's Nabucco West uh, or, uh, or, or TAP, for it to be a successful project, uh, there, it, has to, it has to obviously uh, provide a sufficient return. So the question is, what's the pricing going to be uh, down the road? What's the pricing? Yeah, Italy's had good prices uh, in the past. Uh, <clears throat> but given uh, their sources of supply, given the present situation, is that pricing going to hold up? What's the pricing going to be like uh, in Baumgarten and on into Europe uh, over, uh, over the coming years? I think these issues do have to be addressed, and the parties do need to work together to make sure that, as Kettle mentioned, that all elements of the value chain are constructed in a way that everybody can end up, uh, en end up making a profit. I think that can be done, uh, whichever project is chosen, but it's going to take all of the parties, the Shaktanese Consortium, the countries involved, the project, the pipeline project sponsors, all to work together uh, to, make sure, uh, to make sure that that happens. Uh, and I think it will, I think it will happen. That brings me, uh, and I think it relates, uh, since I think you mentioned it, uh, Al, in your, at the, in, in, in your statement, your initial statement, uh, and it's certainly in the news today because of what's happened in Bulgaria, where Bulgaria has signed, a, uh, signed an agreement with Southstream. And the question, what effect, uh, is, what effect is Southstream going to have? I'll tell you very frankly what I think, anyway, about it. I'd say, first of all, Countries have a right to do whatever they want to do as far as uh, uh, uh, making decisions on projects. And if countries want to participate in the, in the South Stream project, uh, so be it. Uh, <clears throat> having said that, there's still a long way from here to there with respect to the South Stream project. And there are any number of regulatory issues that need to be worked through with the European Union. I mean, I could get into that in detail, but we don't have time to do that now. But, but there, are, <coughs> there, are, there are certainly issues there, certainly financing issues uh, and, uh, and the like. Having said that, I'm not sure that South Stream really will have much of an effect at all uh, on the Southern Corridor. Uh, <clears throat> where it's going to have the most effect, perhaps, uh, would be in the Balkans. But, you know, Russia is not going to roll over. I mean, they're going to compete in the Balkans, whether there's South Stream or not. And that's going to be an issue that's going to have to be dealt with. And so I don't see the issue so much as being the Balkans, but it comes back to what's the pricing going to be, in the case of Nabucco West, beyond the Balkans, in Baumgarten and beyond, and also, for that matter, with respect to TAP, what's the pricing ultimately going to be in Italy, and potentially north of Italy, as 
you know, different actions, you know, take place with respect to, uh, um, with respect to gas being delivered there. That's what the issue is going to be. I don't think it's going to be South Stream. And it comes back to the point that the parties have to work together in a situation where pricing may be uncertain over the next five to ten years, uh, whatever, uh, to, again, work together to make sure that all, all elements of the value chain work. And I think that's the challenge. I think it'll happen. I think everybody's committed to it happening. I think the Southern Corridor is critical, not just from a commercial standpoint, also from a strategic standpoint, even with South Stream and the Balkans. It's necessary to have competing you know, competition uh, in that part of Europe. And at the end of the day, that what's the most important is that Europe develop a competitive market, as I think it's trying to do with the third energy package, with respect to actions taken by the EU uh, in the competition area, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and to get, have as many diverse sources of supply as possible. That includes new pipelines, it includes LNG, it may include shale, it includes interconnections uh, between countries and other things, which I think are the most important things as far as Europe is concerned. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick. Very wide-ranging observations that I think justified our placing confidence in you here to add at the, at the tail end of the beginning of this session uh, the fullest possible picture of the issues. Um, I want to open uh, the discussion up to questions. Uh, we'll have a couple over here. Let me, let me take the moderator's prerogative, though, and ask the first. Uh, and that, I think, mostly is, uh, is a question for Al. Um, there are some important decisions that the consortium is going to make relates to these two competing projects. Obviously, you don't want to talk too much about some of the specifics there, but if you could talk a little bit about what are the key factors that are at play here. Uh, Dick has referred to issues of price. Prices will vary in different parts of Europe. Uh, there clearly are issues of financing and the capitalization of these respective projects. There may be political issues, certainly, uh, for the government of Azerbaijan there are. Can you talk a little bit about what, what, are, the, what are the key factors that BP and the, and the consortium would be looking at as it makes this momentous choice? And then, and then I'll turn to the audience. Certainly, certainly. Uh, I think um, for two years now, we've had a consistent framework within which we look at pipeline options into Europe. And that framework balances commercial drivers, but also strategic drivers, and also engineering drivers, and, and elements like the reliability uh, of exports as well. We used that framework for the selection that led to TAP being selected over ITGI and Nabucco being selected over SEEP. And we will consistently use that framework going forward. But more specifically to, to your question, I think it's the work we need to do as now prospective partners within Nabucco and TAP to make sure that between now and the middle of next year, we can de-risk the projects and increase the value of the projects to a sufficient degree that the value of the whole 4,000 kilometer chain of platforms and pipelines and pump stations actually makes sense as a commercial proposal. So what do I mean by that? I think for both projects, we've got to make sure that um, on the commercial side, two basic factors are in place. Um, the right gas prices and the, the right transportation tariff to get the gas to the key markets. In terms of the right gas prices, uh, we've been in a good situation with an over-demand uh, for Azerbaijani gas, and we need to work with our customers to make sure that, um, that that desire to import Azerbaijani gas continues uh, through until we, we sign gas sales contracts in the middle of next year. On the transportation tariff, I think we need to work very closely with TAP and Nabucco to create that right balance of cost and expandability. And what we can't afford at this stage is excess capacity, um, which might or might not be used in the future. From a Chardonnay's perspective, we've got to make sure 
that they're economic up front, whilst all the time preserving the ability to have expandability beyond that. So I think that's, that's key on the commercial side. On the political side, it's about demonstrating strong and stable government support. I think Nabucco has always enjoyed a huge degree of support from the European Commission and from the governments that signed up to the original intergovernmental agreement and met recently to confirm that that IGA uh, supports Nabucco West. Um, TAP has uh, had a shorter history on that front than Nabucco, but has moved extremely fast. And certainly the MOU signed by the Albanian, Greek, and Italian governments in New York a couple of months ago was an absolutely fundamental step towards cementing that political support. I do, however, think it's uh, a second fundamental step needs to be taken for TAP, and that would be the signing of an intergovernmental agreement between those three countries over the upcoming months. And we'll be working very closely with TAP to ensure that the Italian, Greek, and Albanian government can put in place that level of certainty, which is fundamental to, uh, to a successful project going forward. So the criteria will be um, as we've set out, and I think the difference will be this time around us working very closely with uh, Reinhardt's team and the partners of Nabucco, us very, working very closely with TAP and E.ON, Statoil, and EGL there to, uh, to really develop as best as possible two pipeline options that are both commercially viable and politically supported. Good. Thank you very much. Let me open it up to, to questions. Uh, if I could ask each of you uh, to identify yourself and please confine yourself to a question. Uh, and then we will go forward. And I have two over here uh, in the, in the sec third row back and then, uh, and then the one in front. Uh, Asim, or either, doesn't matter. Please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Olgu Okumush from Science Expo Paris, uh, Science Expo Institute in Paris. So I have two questions, uh, one for Mr. Konuk and the second for Mr. Michek. Uh, Sayın Mehmet Konuk, ee, BOTAŞ bugün TANAP'ta ortak değil, TAP'ta da değil. Nabucco'da 16,5 ortak ama Nabucco küçüldü. TANAP'ın Türkiye'nin sahibi olduğu %20'si kimin? BOTAŞ'ın mı? BOTAŞ'ın değilse BOTAŞ Güney Enerji Koridoru'nun neresinde? And Mr. Michek, my question concerns the future of Nabucco or Nabucco West. So, so the reluctance of shareholders of Nabucco pipeline, does it have an effect, I mean negative or positive effect, on the future of Nabucco? Uh, if shareholders, if some shareholders of Nabucco moves out, it will affect Nabucco pipeline company. Thank you. Thank you. And let's take the next question right behind, Asim Malazadeh. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Asim Malazadeh, member of Azerbaijani parliament. Early 90s, there were great skepticism about any possible transport corridor. But as a result of efforts of US government, now we have an existing system. Uh, my question uh, links to perspectives of Transcaspian uh, system. Because uh, now we feel there is a lack of American efforts on uh, this issue. Is it because of uh, some uh, uh, problem on transatlantic cooperation or uh, reset button pushed between the US and Russia? But uh, without US efforts, it never will happen. And uh, my question, uh, is the US government supporting Transcaspian? Because it will give an additional gas and uh, we can share it between two uh, competing projects. Thank you. Uh, three, so we have three questions. Uh, one, a very specific uh, question with respect to the 20% share of TANAP that belongs to Turkey. Uh, more general question uh, to Al, uh, I think to uh, Reinhold about, um, uh, about Nabucco. Uh, and then a third question about Transcaspian gas. And maybe turn that to, uh, to Dick Morningstar. Mr. Konuk. Uh, evet. uh, Hükümetler arası anlaşmada Türkiye'nin kamu şirketi olarak BOTAŞ ve TFA'nın yüzde yirmilik 
listesinin olacağı anlaşmada zaten yer alıyor. Eğer BOTAŞ TANAP projesinde yer almamış olsaydı ben şu anda karşınızda bu panelde olmamam gerekiyordu. İkincisi e, Nabukovest'teki ortaklık payımız devam ediyor. Evet e, TAP ve IGTI ile alakalı daha önceki dönemlerde yapılan görüşmeler projelerle ilgili e, değerlendirmeler bu tabakat zaptları vardı. Ama somut olarak şu anda BOTAŞ TANAP projesinin içerisinde ve Nabuko West'in de e, belirlenmiş olan yüzde on altı nokta yedilik hisse oranıyla ortağıdır. Teşekkür ederim. The question for the Nabucco shareholders. Um, Nabucco has a very robust uh, group of, uh, of shareholders that are the national champions in every country uh, we, we cross. And uh, if we successfully conclude our negotiations with Shaktinis, then some, others, some other shareholders, strong shareholders, will come into this group, so I absolutely feel uh, comfortable with this group of shareholders and I'm fully confident uh, that uh, we can deliver the project uh, in time, in budget, and with the respective care needed uh, to be, uh, to be uh, the, the, the strongest link in this chain. Because one topic is clear, it is a very complex issue uh, to realize this gas chain from the uh, wellhead to the burner tip and the whole gas chain is as strong as the weakest part. So therefore, we all have to take care uh, that we perform well uh, in order to, to prove uh, that uh, the trust and the necessary care is, uh, will, will be satisfied and uh, market requirements will be satisfied and customers will receive the services uh, they expect. Thank you very much. Dick on Transcaspian. First of all, let me say that uh, our position on the Trans-Caspian gas pipeline has nothing whatsoever to do with any reset question with Russia uh, or the transatlantic relationship. Uh, I've been working on a Trans-Caspian pipeline for, as Matt Bryson knows, my predecessor in Azerbaijan over there, since we were working on it together, uh, for 15 years. and. Uh, and, nothing, and Steve Mann as well, who's there, and I'm sure that I could point to several other people in the audience who've been working on a Trans-Caspian pipeline, and nothing has happened. We fully support a Trans-Caspian pipeline. When the EU began its negotiations with Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan, I said that that's great, that we fully support it, and if they are successful uh, in Concluding negotiations, I'll be the first person out there dancing on the streets, in the streets. Uh, it's something we've thought about for, a, obviously, for a very long time. But I have to be fully honest with you, frank with you, as I always am, uh, <clears throat> that there are problems. First problem is that Turkmenistan is still unwilling to allow international companies on the ground in Turkmenistan. I don't know how you finance a Trans-Caspian gas pipeline without some kind of international cooperation with Turkmen gas. And until there's an international company on the ground, my own view, this is my personal view, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, second, there are still uh, issues uh, uh, obviously, uh, there's opposition uh, by Russia and Iran uh, to a Trans-Caspian pipeline. We've always been of the view, as long as the pipeline uh, crosses waters that are either Turkmen or Azeri, that should be enough uh, to allow uh, the pipeline <coughs> to go forward. But the question, I think, that is still out there, 
is Turkmenistan really willing, apart from the question of international companies, is Turkmenistan really willing to go forward at this point with such a pipeline? Or is it leverage with the Russians? Or is it something else? I don't know. I think Turkmenistan, for it to go forward, has to show, one, that it's willing to work with international companies, and two, make very clear uh, that it will, is willing to make an agreement that's reasonable in nature as far as crossing the Caspian and not asking for too much from uh, uh, either Azerbaijan or the European Union. Dick, all of us look forward to seeing you dance in the streets. A question here in the front. If we can bring a microphone up here in the front row, please. Thank you. Friedbert Pflüger, King's College, London. Um, I have a question to basically Al Cook. We heard from uh, Reinhard Mitschek and from uh, Kjetil Tungland um, about, well, both believe they will win the contest. And you talked about the, the final that you, you want to win. But given the enormous amount of money, resources, and skills both of you have put into your projects, uh, discussing with governments, host government agreements, uh, all the planning you have done. Uh, is it not a waste of resources if, uh, if, if, if the contest has only one winner? Uh, given the huge amount of gas the Russians ship with Nord Stream, which they want to double right now, with South Stream, which is a huge project compared to both of yours, is it not uh, a possible idea to uh, may have two winners at the at the very end. How how big are the chances for this from your point of view? Uh, I think that's a that's a good question. Um, first of all, we recognise the vast amount of investment, both political and commercial investment, that's gone into both TAP and Nabucco. And as we look to make a decision in June 2013, we recognize that in order for the pipelines to continue in, to invest between now and then, we need to invest alongside them. And that is why a number of the Chardonnay's consortium members, uh, Statoil, Socar, Total, BP, um, will be investing in both TAP and Nabucco and funding those pipelines uh, from now until a selection is made. I think to the other part of your question, is it, is it possible to take two? In the long term, absolutely. If the volumes of gas that we're talking about uh, between Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, uh, northern Iraq um, are developed, uh, there is easily enough demand for two pipelines into Europe. But I think this comes back down again to this balance between cost efficiency and scalability. Transporting gas 4,000 kilometers from the Caspian Sea to burn it in Europe is something that is always going to be tough economically. It's always going to be an economic challenge to make enough money out of that to pay for and make an economic return on $40 billion of capital investment. So just as we can't afford uh, large amounts of overcapacity, in the first instance, for Chardonnays, uh, we could not afford to pay the costs of two uh, large pipelines into Europe. Longer term, I think you could see two being developed. I think there's one other important principle as well, which uh, Ambassador Morningstar referred to, and that is that uh, even if we choose um, Nabucco, we would expect to be having some gas along the tap route uh, through a smaller pipeline into Greece, and even if we chose tap, we would expect to have some gas along a smaller pipeline into Southeast Europe. And part of the intent of that is to set in place the precedent for two export routes from Turkey that over time could mean two fully-fledged pipelines out of Turkey. 